Hello everyone, thank you for joining me here today as I give you a brief introduction to basic microscopy and introduce you to some of the common terms that you'll come across and hopefully leave you with a better understanding of how light microscopy can be applied to your research. My name is Courtney Wright and I'm one of the light microscopists at the Brain and Mind Centre as part of the light and optical team for Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions during this presentation by sending me an email to the address you can see on the screen now, or my final slide has some other contact points for you to get in touch with myself or another member of the light and optical team. Please also stay with us for the day as my colleagues expand on other light microscopy techniques that are available for your research and data analysis. So without further ado, Today, I'll give you a brief introduction into light microscopy and take you through some of the components that you would find within your light microscope. We'll then move into bright field imaging and other basic techniques that you can use these microscopes for. I'll give you a very brief overview of some sample preparation that you might utilize for bright field imaging and which Sue will expand on later on in this series of talks. I'll then go through some key acronyms and terms that you will become more familiar with as you carry out your microscopy, and some of these will be further explained in the context of fluorescence microscopy and data analysis in later presentations. All right, let's get into it. So what is light microscopy? Light microscopy is using light to view, discover and magnify objects that are smaller than the naked eye can see. For this, we use a small section of the electromagnetic spectrum, that is the visible spectrum of light, or white light. That's the light that spans from the UV range down at about 350 to 400 nanometers, up to the near infrared spectrum at around 700 nanometers. Some of you will undoubtedly remember undertaking a similar experiment in high school physics that demonstrates the ability of white light to be split into its component wavelengths when it is refracted through a prism. It's the same principle as generating rainbows through raindrops. You can image using other types of energy on the electromagnetic spectrum, including X-rays, but for our purposes, we're just sticking to this visible spectrum. White light illuminates our samples and is both transmitted through and absorbed by our specimen. Utilising a series of lenses, we can focus that light and magnify what we are seeing. As some of this light is absorbed by the sample, we produce contrast, allowing us to gain important biological information about the world around us. The first basic light microscopes were really quite simple and basically consisted of a single lens or a curved piece of glass in the late 1500s. Over the next 100 years came the seminal work Micrographia by Robert Hooke, who used microscopes that he had designed himself using one, two and three lenses. This was really the birth of the compound microscope. These microscopes continued to be refined over the centuries to result in the more familiar shape and style that we have in our basic light microscopes today, which is the image on the bottom far left. Most of you will be familiar with this style of microscope as it's a lab staple and a workhorse on most lab benches. Let's delve into what actually makes up a basic transmitted light or bright field microscope and the different components that affect the light path. The first thing that we need to take note of in a basic bright field microscope is the light source. As mentioned in my first slide, we utilize a white light source and that's usually a halogen bulb in a bright field system. This is our illumination source for our sample. The light that is generated from our halogen bulb penetrates through an internal lens called a condenser. The condenser focuses the light onto the specimen and reduces any light scattering, allowing us to capture a really crisp image. Next, we have the specimen itself. This is usually some sort of contrasted stained tissue or cells. You don't have to have stained cells and I'll go into a technique later on that allows you to visualize them without contrast. 
Next, we move on to the objectives. This is our first point of magnification of our image, and these range from anywhere to from four times up to 100 times in a bright field microscope and can be used dry with water or oil as specified. Each objective has a series of specific characteristics that will be more useful for certain imaging requirements, and Pam will go through these in her presentation. The objective collects the light that is transmitted through the specimen and focuses it to produce the image that we are then able to see through the final part of the light microscope, which is the oculars, or if we want to capture an image, we see it through the camera. Now that I've gone through the basic components within a light microscope, I'm going to talk about some of the imaging modalities most often used on one of them. The most common type of imaging on a system like the one shown previously is bright field. This is the most simple form of microscopy that utilizes white light transmitted through a contrasted specimen. Areas of high contrast such as pigmented stains absorb the transmitted light and provide contrast for the image. These systems are usually wide field systems, which means that the whole specimen is usually illuminated by the light source rather than specific discrete regions that might allow you to concentrate and focus the light in a particular way, allowing for better depth resolution. Some of my colleagues will discuss this and build on these principles later on in the advanced imaging talks. The images you can see on the slide are typical of what you might acquire using a bright field system. And these include counter stain fungal species, microbiological stains for differentiating gram positive and gram negative bacteria, and for immunohistochemistry for specific proteins and cell types for pathological identification. This is one of the major uses of bright field microscopes to assist in the diagnosis of disease states from patient samples. There are some excellent reasons for utilizing bright field imaging. These include a simple sample preparation, and the samples can be viable for decades so that you can keep re-imaging them long after they are cover slipped. You can also image multiple types of samples, and you won't have any issues like spectral overlap or bleed through that you might experience with fluorescent imaging. There are, however, limitations to bright field. You can't image very thick tissue, and you're often limited to a single optical section or a 2D plane. And while you can image live cells with modifications to the light path, you cannot counter stain live cells as most dyes are toxic to them. There are also limits to the resolution of images you can gain due to the scattering of light inherent with using a wide field system. While bright field imaging is highly useful, what happens if your samples are not stained with a chromogen or happen to be alive in a dish so you can't throw a stain in there in order to get a specific contrast for fear of killing the cells. The answer is you enhance the contrast of your specimen by adjusting the way transmitted light illuminates your sample to give you different information and complementary images. You will need specific filters and prisms within your light path, but the most basic systems are able to perform at least some of these other techniques, which include on the top left, DIC, and that's an image of some unstained fibroblasts from a deer. The top right, phase contrast microscopy, and that's a single-celled algae. The bottom left, polarized light microscopy, and that's some renal amyloidosis that's been stained with Congo red. And dark field microscopy on the bottom right, and this is an image of some cheek epithelial cells. We'll start with the most common of these techniques, which is probably DIC. DIC stands for Differential Interference Contrast and is an excellent method for generating contrast in unstained samples such as cells, nematodes and bacteria. For this technique, we need a few extra components added into our light path, which are polarizers and Namaski prisms. Rather than using a single plane of transmitted white light, DIC utilizes polarized light. For this to occur, two separate polarizers are added into the microscope, one at the bottom, just in front of the light source, and one at the end of the light path. The one at the end of the light path is also referred to as the analyzer, which converges the polarized light waves back into a single plane to view within the eyepiece. 
The polarizer essentially splits light from a radiating 360 degree beam into a single linear beam. This single beam then traverses the first Namaski prism, which splits it into two beams, which then run perpendicular to each other. The condenser focuses both of these beams, and as they traverse the sample, the wave paths will alter depending on the thickness and therefore the refractive index of the sample. The waves are then recombined within a second prism, though they now have different lengths because of passing through different densities within the specimen. This is what provides us with different contrast to provide that 3D-like effect. This 3D effect can also be altered by introducing positive or negative bias, which allows you to see whether the shorter optical paths appear as either raised or depressed in the final image. This technique is often combined with fluorescence microscopy to identify specific regions of interest within living samples, of which the living sample is usually unstained. The images on the left are typical of the sort of images you will generate with a DIC and say a green fluorescent protein. The next method that we'll look at is phase contrast. This is a method of light microscopy that is also used on low contrast or unstained samples, like cells to enhance their contrast. Thinner samples tend to work more effectively for this type of imaging. The microscope again needs some additional parts to the optical pathway in order to achieve the images that you see on the screen. It requires a condenser annulus at the beginning of the light path and a phase plate at the end of the light path. The condenser annulus or phase stop produces a hollow cone of light that illuminates the sample. Light is then diffracted by the specimen. The light that is traveling through the specimen is diffracted or retarded by the sample and undergoes what we know as a phase shift. The direct light that travels straight from the condenser is unretarded and does not interact with the specimen. This means that we have two phases of light and they are now out of phase with each other due to the changes in the refractive index of the sample components. Both of these waves then pass through the phase plate at the back of the objective and either add together or cancel each other out to produce a contrast for your image as in it's either a more bright or less bright region within the sample. So when you have a particularly dense region within a cell like a nucleus, it will slow down the waves more than say the cytoplasm, resulting in a contrast between these two regions. There are also usually artifacts term halos in phase contrast imaging that are a result of a small amount of diffracted light from the specimen being transmitted by the ring that's at the back of the objective phase plate. The next technique available is polarized light. Again, for this technique, you need to add in two polarizers to your microscope. The first polarizer placed before the specimen converts your light into a linear wave. The light waves that travel through the specimen have different speeds, again based on the refractive index of the specimen, and are then combined in a second polarizer or analyzer for maximum contrast. The most, second most important part of polarized light microscopy is your sample. Your sample must be bifringent. So what does this essentially mean? What is bifringence other than an excellent score in Scrabble? Bifringent specimens exhibit double refraction. That means that light that passes through them is refracted into two rays that travel perpendicular to each other and have different velocities. These are termed the ordinary and extraordinary waves. These waves will vary as they propagate through the specimen. After they exit the specimen, they are out of phase again, but are recombined with either constructive or destructive interference as they pass through the analyzer resulting in bright or dark regions in your resultant image. This technique is often used for material specimens such as crystals and asbestos fibers as shown in the images on screen. However, in biology, some dyes also exhibit biofringent properties such as Congo red. Congo red is often used to identify amyloids in pathological tissue and it exhibits a very characteristic apple green color. This technique, while very useful, is obviously limited by your sample.
Okay, the final technique that I'll discuss here is dark field. So as its name suggests, it is essentially the opposite to bright field. Instead of being your sample being contrasted against a white background that you usually see in bright field, dark field contrasts a bright specimen against a dark background. This is a technique that we use on unstained transparent samples such as bacteria and cells. Again, we need specific components within the light path to generate this technique. A disc or stop is placed at the light source and condenser. As white light comes from the lamp, it hits the disc that blocks the light from entering into the condenser, leaving a circular ring on the outside. This outer ring is focused by the condenser onto the sample, allowing only the oblique rays that have originated from a large angle to hit the specimen. The sample either transmits or scatters the light based on the differences in refractive index of those sample parts. The scattered faint light enters the objective lens, but the transmitted light does not, resulting in a bright image on an otherwise dark background. So those above techniques I've presented are all quite nice for several reasons relating to sample preparation or the samples that you happen to have. Sue will be giving an in-depth presentation on, sample, on methods of sample prep, so I'm just going to touch on some important factors for bright field imaging. Some of the above techniques require no fixation. Others do require your samples to be fixed, and this is usually done through PFA, paraformaldehyde, or fresh frozen tissue that is then cut on either a cryotome, microtome, or vibratome. Fresh frozen tissue can be stored for a long time, and the longer time that you have a sample sitting in paraformaldehyde, it loses some of its antigenicity. This may be problematic if you're trying to use immunohistochemistry for small proteins, but overall, most fixed tissues stain well for bright field imaging. Samples for bright field imaging also need to be thin enough so that the light can be transmitted through them if you're looking for high contrast. Other methods are more preferable for thick tissue, such as confocal that Pam and Neftali will discuss. However, if you cut your samples too thick or too thin, you might end up with poor penetration of antibodies for your immunohistochemistry. You also need to be careful if you're cutting fresh frozen tissue to ensure that you have the appropriate temperature within your cutting chamber so that you don't either melt or shear your tissue, resulting in cutting teeth defects and terrible images at the end. When it comes to labeling your tissue for bright field, you need to think about what you're trying to find out and how will contrast help you to discover the answer to those questions. Do you need to use immunohistochemistry or is a basic chromogen going to be good enough? Should you stain your tissue in a vial or is it better to stain it on a slide? Finally, when you mount your sample, you need to think about the thickness of your cover slip and the type of media that you'll be mounting it with. You have to check that your tissue has been correctly washed because if it hasn't, you might end up with a completely blue or purple or red slide. You also need to ensure that your slides have been correctly prepared to ensure your samples don't float away or crinkle up on your slide to become unusable. If you're working with very, very precious tissue, you wanna make sure you get these things right. All of these factors need to be considered before you can even put your sample onto a microscope. So I implore you to take the time to get these things right so you end up with beautiful samples that have been prepared correctly that will result in the ability to generate a beautiful image. Before we get onto the common terms in microscopy, there are several considerations that you need to take into account when you're taking an image on a bright field microscope. You don't just throw a sample on, turn on a light and click a picture. It's not an iPhone. You should always keep in mind your scientific question and how your sample is able to help you identify answers to that question. Once you've decided how your sample will be prepared, you will need to decide on which optical technique for imaging you'll be using and learn what objectives are available on that system for you to use and which one is best for you. Then make sure you acquire the right sort of image for your analysis and that you have an idea of how you will complete that analysis. There is no point in taking hundreds of images only to realize there was a setting that was wrong and now they're all unusable.
I'm going to take you through some of the common terms and hopefully they'll be of use to you and you can think about them while you're imaging and these will help you to develop your understanding so optimising your image acquisition is an easier process. To start with, the incident light or white light needs to be properly aligned so that you do not have an uneven illumination field on your specimen where there is glare or shadowed portions known as vignetting. That way you can maximise the contrast of your specimen. This will allow you to improve the resolution of the microscope and needs to be matched to each objective each and every time that objective is changed when you want to acquire an image. The process for this is called color illumination. You need to align what are called the conjugate planes within the light path so that the light reaching your specimen is both directed and encompasses the whole field of view. This is done by adjusting certain diaphragms within the light path, including the condenser aperture diaphragm and the field diaphragm. You may also need to center the condenser to ensure that the light being transmitted through your sample is central to the viewing tube. In the image on the screen currently, the condenser aperture is quite open. This allows a lot of light to enter the objective. So while the image detail is visible, there is glare and it is quite bright because there is a lot of scattered light. This system has not been correctly colored. In the next image, the condenser aperture has been closed down and we lose the ability to see some of those details clearly. The image is also quite dark, resulting in abnormal representations of the colours of the specimen. This system has been incorrectly coloured and has a lot of refraction artefacts. The next image has the condenser aperture open to a level that permits the fine details of the sample to be visible with enough contrast and light so that there are no artefacts from any distorted light. There is no glare on this image or bright spots, so the system has likely been correctly collared. So once you've collared your microscope, you're ready to start imaging. I mentioned NA during collar illumination. NA stands for the numerical aperture and is a number that allows you to determine the resolving power of an objective and how well that lens in the objective is able to collect the light from your sample. It brings into account the refractive index of the media, which I'll discuss in the next slide, and the angle by which the cone of light accesses the object, also known as theta. The lower the NA, the further away the objective can be from the sample. This is important because higher numerical aperture objectives have a larger theta angle, which allows them to capture more light, resulting in a better signal to your image detectors. This number is written on the outer barrel of your objective, usually underneath the magnification number. Pam will go into this in more detail in her presentation. The next term we're going to touch on is refractive index. The refractive index is a measure of how much a light ray bends when it is moved from one medium into another. This is easily seen when you pop a pencil into a glass of water and you see it shift to look like it has moved. For air, the refractive index is close to 1. More dense materials such as water and glycerin have a higher refractive index and can assist in increasing the numerical aperture of the objective that are designed to be used with these materials. Resolution is another term that you will hear that is often unclear. Resolution in microscopy is the ability to differentiate two separate points that are close together allowing us to differentiate and identify details within our images. The resolution of your image is dependent upon the numerical aperture. When you capture an image from a microscope, it might look excellent until you use your mouse wheel to zoom in and look at the finer detail. Here is a zoomed out version of two images below, which look quite similar. However, when you zoom in, the resolution on the left image is far poorer than the image on the right, where it looks much more crisp and the details and edges are more distinct. Therefore, the image on the right hand side has been captured with a better resolution. Resolution can also be affected by digital imaging parameters, which both Pam and Michael will discuss in detail in their talks, and I will touch on some of those now. Uh, which camera you have on your system. 
Well, like everything in microscopy, there is a trade-off. Uh, CCDs tend to use more power but produce low, low noise images, whereas CMOS cameras use less power but tend to generate a more noisy image, which is less, therefore less sensitive. They are, however, faster. The type of camera might become significant to your experiments if you are trying to capture fast live cell cellular events, but for general bright field, either type on your microscope will be fine. Cameras are important because they allow us to turn those photons into a digital image, and the better the camera, the more detail you will have in your image. They do this through a series of bright points called pixels. A pixel is a measure of the intensity of the image. These are represented as a scale from black to white with tones of grey in the middle. If you look at this with a real case scenario, on the left we have a grayscale analog image of some microtubules. The image is then segmented into a 2D array by a process known as digital sampling by the camera, where we see the picture be converted into variations of grey levels. The brightness of these individual grey levels are then quantized into integers. The whole purpose of this practice is to convert the image into discrete points of which each point gives you information about the brightness or tone that is described by the specific integer in a specific location. These are coded into numbers or quantized to assign a specific brightness level to each of these data points ranging from one as black, 255 as white and other varying shades of grey in the middle. These are your pixels of an image. This matters in microscopy as a one megapixel camera will collect less pixels than a 12 megapixel camera and will result in a grainier, lower quality image. Your digital imaging quality is also dependent upon the bit depth of the camera it was acquired at. What does this mean? Well, a higher bit acquisition will allow the digital processing to better reflect the actual tones and therefore the visual accuracy of your image. A one bit image only has two tones, black and white. As your bit depth increases, more tones or shades are available for your image. The higher the bit depth, there are less increments between those gray levels on your camera and therefore more tones to accurately display shade and contrast within your image. Here is a table of how corresponding bit depth affects the number of tones in both a grayscale and a color image. As mentioned, a one bit image is binary. We just have black and white. If you look at the five bit grayscale color palette, you can see where each of these blocks changes to the next tone. This is known as banding artifact and is associated with lower bit depth acquisitions. This artifact is gone when we look at say a 14 bit grayscale image, as we now have more intermediate tones that allow the gradations to blend more seamlessly together. This is also quite noticeable with the color palette between say an eight and a 10 bit image, though banding in some colors is a lot less easily discernible with the human eye. Michael will go into this more in depth in his image analysis presentation. The next common term that we'll be looking at is magnification. This is a pretty simple one in microscopy. It's just the process of enlarging the apparent size of an object. In microscopy, the end magnification that we end up seeing is a summation of the magnification of the objective plus the magnification of the eyepiece. So therefore, if we had a 10 times ocular and we added that to our four times objective, we'd end up with a total magnification of 40 times. The magnification of your objective is obviously written on the objective and you should be able to see on the eyepiece what that magnification is as well. The next common term that we will see and use a lot in microscopy is your lookup table or your LUT. A lookup table is basically a histogram or a picture that represents the digital image. So the number of pixels and the intensity of that spread of tone. When you have your lookup table selected, you want to capture the maximum amount of the dynamic range. That is how much of those pixels the camera will actually capture. This gives you information that may not be noticeable to the eye, 
so that you can acquire the best picture. If you happen to be looking at your image and you think it looks good, always select your lookup table so that you can see if you are in fact capturing the maximum amount of that dynamic range, which will give you the most information about that image. Another term that you'll commonly come across in bright field microscopy is over and under saturation. This is a measurement of how saturated the pixels in your image are, and a good image should have very few over or under saturated pixels. When you generate an image, these will either be really, really bright spots or really, really dark spots. It's important that you identify these because over or under saturated pixels are ejected from the camera. So you're not capturing all of the data from your image, which means your analysis will be substandard. The bottom pictures here on the left both have a good over under saturation. There's very few red or blue pixels seen within them. However, the images on the right have way too many red or blue pixels. They are both over and under saturated because some of the imaging parameters were wrong during acquisition. On this slide, we have two very similar looking images that were acquired on the left hand side of the screen with the red boxes around them. However, when I activate my over and under saturation settings of those images, you can see that the bottom right hand image has a lot of blue pixels that designate under saturation and a lot of red pixels that designate over saturation. The top right image, however, has very few red or blue pixels. And so this would be the better image because we have less over and under saturated data there. Therefore, we're acquiring as much information about that image as possible. Another technique that you will have to apply when you're using bright field imaging is to white balance. This removes the color that is cast into the image resulting from the light source, improper washing, microscope optics, or the camera. Generally, you'll move to an area with no specimen and only the cover slip and select the white balance option within the software. Why is this important? Because you want to be able to reflect the true color or true nature of that sample. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Here is an image that was acquired without white balancing, and this one was acquired on a separate day. Neither of these slides had been white balanced, so you can see the image on the left has a slightly bluey green cast, and the image on the right has a slightly more red pigmented cast. Now, once I white balanced those images, this is what we end up with. This is a more accurate and true representation of the actual sample and the actual colors. One of the key factors that must be optimized when acquiring a bright field image is your exposure time which directly contributes to the over and under saturation of your image pixels. Exposure is a measure of how long the camera sensor is exposed to light during image acquisition. By activating your lookup table, you can adjust the exposure time based off the saturation of your pixels as we discussed two slides earlier. The higher the exposure time, usually in milliseconds for a bright field image, the more likely you are to generate oversaturated pixels and lose information that might be necessary for your later analysis. Below are some images of a H&E stained kidney sample where the exposure time during acquisition has been changed. The image on the far left was captured with a low exposure of eight milliseconds and is very dim with details hard to distinguish in the tissue. The middle image was exposed for 20 milliseconds and is well lit and details are noticeable. The image on the right was imaged for 30 milliseconds and is overexposed and this is obvious by the glare of the sample and the inability to make out structures. Therefore, the middle image has been optimised with the appropriate exposure time for this particular sample. This brings us to the end of my presentation, and I have a few messages that I'd like you to take home. You need to ensure that you know how your light microscope works and all of its components. You need to take the time to set up your imaging correctly. Make sure that you know how to color illuminate so that you generate a really clean, crisp image at the end. Use all the modalities as well that are available to you on your microscope if they assist you with answering your question. Don't just settle for what everybody else in your lab does. You need to familiarize yourself 
with the terminology so that you can optimize your images um, and ensure you have a really good sample preparation because it really does make a difference. If you spend the time generating a good sample, you'll probably be able to generate a good image afterwards. I would like to acknowledge the three sources on screen, which provided some of the excellent images and diagrams for my presentation today. I would highly recommend that you visit these sites, which are fantastic resources. And there are a wide number of other online sources and scientific papers that you can use to find any information about bright field microscopy and its varying techniques. As mentioned in my first slide, if you have any questions about today's presentation, please feel free to get in contact with myself or anyone else within the LO staff team at the acmm.lo email on the top of your screen now. And for any other information about our facility, the website details are there. Thank you for staying with me today and enjoy the rest of the talks in this series.